Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today we've got a very special guest on the podcast. His name is T.W. Shannon. He currently serves as the president and CEO of Chickasaw Community Bank and is the state highway commissioner for Central Oklahoma. But back in 2006, he was elected to the Oklahoma House of Representatives, and in 2013, he became the youngest and the first black person to be the Speaker of the House for the state of Oklahoma. In 2017, he was selected as a fellow for the Institute of Politics at Harvard Kennedy School. He also got his Juris Doctorate from Oklahoma City University, and he was a recent guest on the Dan Crenshaw podcast. So for those of you that listen to that podcast, you're going to recognize that name. But he and I share a hometown of Lawton, Oklahoma. You guys have heard me talk about Lawton, Oklahoma before. We're friends. Uh, This is a guy that I've seen do some pretty amazing things. Uh, He's currently affiliated with the Trump administration uh, in terms of the Trump campaign, trying to get reelected for 2020. But this is a guy who has an incredible ability to speak straight to conservative causes. So this is going to be a slightly more political podcast than uh, some of the other interviews that we've done, certainly. But I want you guys to make sure that you listen to this interview because of how TW describes issues. Because I asked him some hard questions today. And whenever I do these interviews, I'm trying to be fair, but I do want to ask questions that are a little bit more difficult, that aren't as puffy as the ones that they may may get on the news or something like that. I wanted to kind of dig a little bit deeper. But this is also a guy that he takes his time and he lets the, the ideas kind of flow from his experience and the things that he's done. This is a tremendous man of God. We, we talked about a lot of different things in this episode, and I I think it'll actually lead to future episodes where we talk about different things, but we're kind of in this interesting spot in the country where we're so close to the next election. There's seemingly so much on the line. There's people saying, oh, it's not really that big a deal. And we have people saying this is everything and it's all consuming, but he has a pretty amazing way of characterizing things in a way that's not going to get you in super crazy fired up, but will allow you to have a very sober minded view on a lot of topics that are incredibly, incredibly controversial. So, I mean, we talked about communism, Marxism, we talked about racism in the United States. We talked about Donald Trump and Joe Biden and what that means for the country. But guys, you're not going to want to miss this interview. But without further ado, let's get into it. T.W. Shannon, welcome to Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Oh, Kyle, thank you for having me. It's an honor, man. Yeah, it's been a while. I haven't seen you in person, but we can blame COVID for that. But we're going to go ahead and launch in here. And here's the funny thing is you and I were actually supposed to have this conversation a week ago. I was in my studio. I had everything set up. I was ready to go. And then I get a message saying that you weren't available. But the reason for it is going to play into a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. So why why are we having this conversation a week late? So, you know, the reason we were you know, not able to keep our original commitment and I apologize for that. I was actually, I had, I was blessed to get to go to the White House last week um, and hear the president on the final day of the Republican convention. I was there on the White House lawn, listening to the president give his acceptance speech. And uh, you and I were scheduled for the following day. Uh, I was going to do it from the airport. Um, But my challenge was um, the the, the protests that happened. My Uber driver, we couldn't get out uh, because there were protests everywhere. Um, and, and, the, and the usual routes were all, because they were so limited, the, the traffic um, you know, kept me from making my flight. So I wound up missing my flight as a result. And that's why I called you to reschedule. Um, I felt terrible about it. And um, I, I, I ask your grace and forgiveness now. Well, you, you can absolutely have my grace and forgiveness. The funny thing about it is as soon as I got your message, I was like, this actually kind of goes in to part of what we're going to be talking about, which is just kind of the state of the country that we're in. Because the thing is, and I, I said this in the intro, but you and I are from the same town, Lawton, Oklahoma, which it's a surprise to most people that a, a small town in southwest Oklahoma can be so diverse. But we've obviously had a, a very diverse upbringing. But that kind of plays into your conservatism in terms of your upbringing. But the, the thing is, T.W., right from the jump, you know, we're just going to go right after it, is black men like yourself are just not supposed to be conservatives you know, air quotes around the word supposed to be. So why do you think most people have that viewpoint? And and why did you become the way that you are in terms of how you think about the world and how you think about politics? You know, Kyle, I, I, I've been asked this question before, and and, and you're right. Um, there, there is a certain box that, you know, often the media and even, you know, modern kind of secular humanist society likes to put African-American men in. Uh, but my reality is that I grew up there in Lawton like you did, and, and I was uh, a member of Bethlehem Baptist Church, a predominantly African-American church. And unlike a lot of liberals, I didn't wait to college to kind of get my 
conservative values, and I didn't get them from a college. I got my conservative values from my church. I mean, you know, where I went to church, I was surrounded by men and women who love the Lord, who, who believe that you shouldn't borrow more than you can pay back. You, you know, you, you owe a debt to the society that, that, that has, that has done so much for you. Um, but there's also a, a culture of personal responsibility. Um, I learned that in my predominantly African American church. And so when I, when I became a, an adult and I started really giving thought to, you know, the political process and, and where my values lined up, it was real easy for me. I mean, as, as, a, as, a, as a believer, uh, somebody who God saved at an early age, um, always knew that, you know, I, I was here, that there was a purpose, that, that God had a purpose for me, that I wasn't a result of some hopping circumstance or that, you know, my life was just kind of meandering through. I knew there was a purpose. I didn't know what that purpose was exactly, uh, but I knew there was one. And, and, and it has been an amazing adventure um, discovering that purpose each and every day. So that, that has been a, a joy for my life. But to answer your question, uh, my conservative values came from my church home and from my, from my Christian upbringing. Well, and to that end, I know that's where a lot of people kind of get those ideas because there's nothing to conserve if you don't have a center point, if you don't have an anchor point that you can point to. But for, for you, and I've heard you talk about this before, but I think it'll be interesting to our to our listeners. A lot of our listeners are concerned about, you know, Hollywood and the university system and the public schooling system and kind of what that's doing to people. It seems like many conservatives are just kind of fighting for the scraps of culture, I guess would be a, a way of saying it. So from your perspective, what is the future of the conservative movement in the United States? Because a lot of conservatives, myself included, are, are a little concerned about what we see on the horizon. Yeah, you know, and, I, and I, I'm always concerned, too. It, it, it always looks as if we're losing, right, that we've got this, um, you know, this 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 world culture that has a different worldview than us and and that somehow you know, we're, we're behind the, we're behind the times, but I tell you what gives me a lot of hope. I get a chance um, to speak a few times around the country at different college campuses. And I will tell you people, the conservative movement is still very, very strong. And I, I think even in what's happened with this COVID and government shutdowns around the country, I think people are really evalu- reevaluating this, this march towards socialism that this country was headed down. I mean, you, you think about this, Kyle. It wasn't but a few months ago where every American was waking up, and I, I would say around March or April, waiting to hear from their local elected mayor whether they were essential or non essential, meaning, are you able to go earn a living for your family or you can't? We were waking up listening to you know, jurisdictions around the country tell us that, you know, we weren't allowed to gather in crowds of more than 10 people, which, of course, you and I both know there's really only one institution whose model is based around, you know, you know, meeting and congregating once a week. uh, And that's the church. Right. Uh, Essentially, churches were shut down. And so I think a lot of people who didn't think about this kind of stuff, and most people don't, most people aren't like you and me, they're not political junkies or, or constitutionalists or, you know, most people are, you know, too busy, you know, frankly, trying to earn a living for their family and put food on the table and, and live their life. But I think even those folks had to stop and think, now, wait a minute, what is the role of government? I don't know if my mayor should be telling me if I can go make a living for my family or if I can. And so right. I, I guess what I'm telling you is I'm optimistic about the future. Um, I'm optimistic that, you know, and obviously we're in the middle of a of a of an election uh, right now, an election season, and I think this election will be very telling about the future of this country, because um, I think the stakes have never been higher, and I think the contrast between the two candidates has never been greater. Either we're going to adopt this Marxist European socialist model of government, or we're going to continue to be the city shining on a hill um, that embraces liberty and freedom. So um, I'm optimistic about the future. Um, But I think we need to do our part to grow our party. Um, We have to make sure we're doing our part to reach out to other groups that historically we haven't, because ultimately we have the solutions that are facing uh, minority groups in particular 
but especially those groups that have been disenfranchised from the society as a whole. Conservatism, it still works. Well, I appreciate your optimism because I find myself being very pessimistic about a lot of things. But I do want to go ahead and dovetail into what you brought up, which is the election that we have coming up, because it seems like every four years we're being told that this election, this is the one, this is the one that sets the foundation for the future. But I think you'd be hard pressed to argue against your point about the the vast difference between Trump and Biden. And and honestly, Biden, I don't think he's as far left as he's portraying, but he knows he can't win uh, the Democratic support unless he goes farther left. But just generically, what are your thoughts on the matchup between Trump and Biden. And as of the recording of this podcast, we're about 70 days out from the election. Yeah. Well, I think I think it's pretty clear. And I think you're right. There is the old Joe Biden that people knew, you know, he was still left of center. But, you know, I, I think the question is that Joe Biden doesn't exist anymore. I mean, the Joe Biden that we see today has fully adopted the, the, the socialist mantle. Um, you know, you look at, you know, what he's pushing in the adoption of AOC's Green New Deal and the way that, you know, he's embraced uh, Bernie Sanders and where, where even Barack Obama a couple of weeks said there's not a whole lot of difference between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. I mean, that was Barack Obama, Obama right. talking. So, right. um, you know, I, I, my, my thoughts are is that the, that party has been completely hijacked by by the extreme left. Um, I think, you know, you look at the the looting and rioting that's happened around the country. Um, you know, it, it took Joe Biden. Here's an example. If, if you think I'm if you think I'm wrong, you know, there has been looting in Portland, Oregon and rioting and violence for 70 plus days now. I think we're on day 75 or day 76. Joe Biden didn't even speak about it until like day 73. You know, the president has been on television, he's been on social media saying, reaching out to liberal Democrat mayors who have failed their cities, whose cities are on fire. And, and he's made the case that he's willing to come in and and be support uh, with, and be, and be a support with the National Guard if invited. And I, and I appreciate the president's approach. I'm a, I'm a constitutionalist and I'm glad he recognizes that we're a federalist society, that, the federal government can't just come in whenever it feels like it, even when it's needed. Um, they still have to work through the appropriate uh, sovereigns that, that that exist there. But it took Joe Biden 73 days before he even mentioned the violence. And I think that's just one example of how different those candidates are. And the, and the reality is this. I fundamentally believe that the greater the freedom, the greater the wealth. And what has kept America the city shining on a hill, it's not just that we've been blessed with amazing resources, and we have. It's not just that we've been given, um, you know, a a great deal of, I I think, God's grace, because we have. It's because we've kept this place safe, and we've kept it a place where liberty um, can survive. And if, if, if for me, it's always about the promulgation of the gospel, right? It's how do you get the gospel spread around the world? And I don't, I don't think we need to adopt a theocracy. I, I'm not, I'm not for a government mandated enforced religion. Um, I don't want government telling me how and where to worship. Uh, but I do want government to keep it safe where I can express my freedom of, of religion, where I can exercise my constitutional right to worship and assembly. And that I think is what has created the greatest society known to man. It's really the promulgation of the gospel around the world, and and it's never been freer than it is in America. And I think that's the real battle that we're fighting. Um, our enemy is not flesh and blood, but you know we know our, our enemy. It, it's 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 spiritual wickedness, right? And and to that end, T W, we we've seen some infringements on that. And there's some forthcoming decisions by the Supreme Court, which will make that even more apparent potentially. But even with what we're seeing with John MacArthur's church out in California, where he's basically opened in defiance of what the local uh, authorities are giving him. But uh, I do want to kind of talk about, you know, before we move on to other topics, um, I want to talk about Donald Trump specifically, because you are affiliated with the Trump campaign. And I just, just to be honest with you, I've been a lifelong Republican. I'm, I'm very conservative in my lean 
leanings. And I've had heartburn over voting for Donald Trump for four and a half years now. Uh, in the Republican primary in 2016, I voted for Marco Rubio uh, for the presidential election. I've talked about a lot on this podcast. I left the top of my ballot blank. I didn't think that Donald Trump or uh, Hillary Clinton met kind of my basic standards of human decency to be voted for. And I also didn't think either of them would govern conservatively, obviously with Hillary. But I've been wrong about Trump in terms of how he's governed. I haven't been wrong about his attitude and, and his his, you know, his behavior on Twitter and how he refers to people and all the things that I'm sure will have be revealed before the election. But what would you say to someone like me? Because there's a lot of people like me out there that we like what the Trump administration has done, but it's Donald Trump that gives us pause. Yeah. So again, I think the most important thing for me when, when I, first of all, when, when I'm, when I'm looking at candidates and and who I'm going to support and where I'm going to throw my hat. And I, and I was happy to, to support Trump early on. I mean, I, I was supporting him back in 15 um, he, during the primary, even though I had friends um, that I believed in and I think would have made a great president too, like um, uh, Senator Ted Cruz, um, like uh, Governor uh, Bush. You know, they, they, they've all been support supportive and helpful to me in my campaigns in the past. Um, and I think they both would have done a great job as well. Uh, but I really felt led to support Trump. And, and what got my attention about him was I knew that he was different than any other candidate. You know, I knew that we needed to shake things up in Washington, D.C. We needed somebody that would look at things from a different angle. And and when I when I start comparing candidates, the first thing I always do is I remind myself they're just they're just men or they're, they're just a woman. Um, no more, no less. And, and that means that they're created in the image of God, just like I am. It also means that they, they were born with a sin nature. And the first person I try to compare candidates to is Jesus. And, and frankly, they all fall short when I do that. Of course. Um, none of them live up to the standard um, that he would have us to live up to, because I know I certainly don't. Um, and so that helps me move on from there, because when I recognize that They've all fallen short, um, and I and I can set up my own measurement and rubric about you know which which faults I think bear more weight and which which you know which of their attributes you know are more important. But the reality is they've all fallen short. What, what I what I know about President Trump, President Trump, and what I saw in him and what I still believe in him is that his his focus for for wanting to see this country do better is unlike anything I've ever seen. And, I, and I've always said this, Kyle, and I've run for office before. People run for office in one of two ways. One of the things I always look at is, why are you running? And most people run either because they want to be somebody or they want to do something. And Donald Trump didn't need to run for office to be somebody. I mean, I've known of him my entire life. I've known who he was. Um, I, I've known about his success in business my entire life. He's been a pop culture figure uh, since I can remember. So he didn't need to do anything to be anybody. He didn't need to run for president in order to be something. He wanted to do something. And, and his story about looking at this country and, and seeing how we were ceding jobs, ceding our place in the world to, to, to places like China and, and recognizing that American exceptional, exceptionalism is real. That was the thing that, that drew me to President Trump. And so for those who, who have quirks about personalities or in idiosyncrasies, I mean, you know, pick your poison. You, you, you can find that in any candidate. You can, you know, I, I don't know any candidate that I agree with 100% of the time, and I don't know any candidate who meets the standard of Jesus. And what, what, I, what, I, what I do know is, is that uh, Donald Trump now has a proven record of moving the needle on supporting conservative issues like no candidate I've seen in the last 60 years. Well, I certainly appreciate that perspective, and that gives uh, myself and a lot of our listeners some food for thought. I do want to transition now into the, you know, the the issue that's on everybody's brain and has been for months now, and that's race in America. Obviously, you would think after a country elects by a landslide, a black president two times in a row to two consecutive terms that, you know, race relations would be going in a positive direction. But I think Barack Obama did a lot of things to actually negate some of the gains that we've made as, as a country. But um, the first thing I guess is I, I kind of have an issue when people talk about 
communities, talking about the designation of a community to a group that just shares the same inherent qualities or the same immutable qualities like the black community or, you know, the, you know, the white community, the Latino community. I think that's a little bit uh, disingenuous. It's almost postmodern to just think of people as groups as opposed to individuals. But from your perspective, obviously, as a black man growing up in the United States of America, being here your entire life, do you feel like the designations of separating groups is helpful for the race conversation in America? You know, I, I think about it scripturally. Kyle, I, I always think about in Revelations, the, the letters to the seven churches. And, you know, each one of those churches had its own personality and its own kind of cultural references. And so I, I don't I don't mind um, people assimilating um, and, and sharing and interacting with, with, with people that look like them and, and have a common experience, whether it be based around their heritage or whether it be based around, you know, Harley Davidson's, you know, whatever, the, whatever your fancy is, that, that's part of what I think makes America great. I think the, the, the challenge is, is when we do that at the exclusion of other groups, when we do that at the exclusion of other opportunities to interact. Um, you know, I'm, I'm okay with, with, with guys who, who drive Fords and, and, you know, my family was a Chevy. It was a Chevy <laughs> right. family. Um, then, you know, the two shall never meet. And when I, when I bought my first Ford, um, you know, my dad had real pause about that. Uh, <laughs> As until he, he should. Over, as yeah, he should, because yeah, yeah, he's a good American. <laughs> That's good, and and you know, but after you know, after I put one hundred fifty thousand miles on it and didn't have any, 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 any issues at all, he became a true believer too. I mean, he saw the value in it. And so, my my point is, I don't I don't want to trivialize uh, race in America, and I don't mean to do that at all because it is important. But my my point is this, you know, what what has helped to make this country great is. It is our differences. I think the rest of the world, you know, you, you look at historically in the early days of our country, you know, people predicted our doom because of our diversity. They said that, you know, that mongrel race of people will never be able to sustain its its its, its culture, that they'll never be able to form a government. Uh, but the reality is the diversity is actually our strength. And while there are differences, there are things that unite us as Americans. Now, unfortunately, in today's time and even during this election, there are groups out there like Antifa who are who are looking to divide us and to focus on the places where we're different. But my, my experience with talking to most Americans, whether they be black, red, orange, purple or white, um, they they genuinely want a better living for a better life for their kids and grandkids. Now, we disagree about what a better life may be. We disagree about how we get there sometimes. But ultimately, those things unite us. And, 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 I, and I, so I don't, I don't fear the, the diversity issue, and I don't fear people assimilating with, with, with like-minded people. But when you start doing it at the exclusion of others, um, I think that is counter, counterproductive, and I think it's countercultural to who we are as Americans. Well, let me ask you this. Um, obviously, Black Lives Matter is no longer a sentence. It hasn't been a sentence for a long time. Now it's an organization that has defined beliefs. They even have a website. So it's like we don't have to guess uh, what these people believe and what they think. Um, but there's been a lot of posturing uh, by media figures and by political figures and by sports figures. I mean, it says Black Lives Matter right there on the court uh, there within the NBA. But from your perspective, what do you think about the Black Lives Matter organization? And what do you think that's doing to help, if anything, race relations in the United States? Well, you know, I'm, I'm like you. I, I always look at, you know, the origin of where things formed and, and and what their purpose is. When I look at the Black Lives Matter website, there are some things that jump out at me that, that concern me greatly. And one of it, one of them being is that, you know, they they are committed to be the antithesis to, 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 to families, to, to core uh, to core strong families. And, and that, that gives me great pause because I believe if we're going to have a great neighborhood, if we're going to have a great city, if we're going to have a great state, if we're going to have a great nation, it starts with strong families. Um, and I also know that the, the, the founders of the group are self-professed trained Marxists. And so that gives me great pause about what their mission and their goal is. Um, now, the question has been asked about 
you know, whose lives matter. And I will just say this, black lives more than matter. Black lives are valuable because they're valuable to God, just like every other life is valuable. And, and so this idea of just saying that they matter, I think life has to more than just matter. I think we have to value life. And, that's, and that means all life. That means even the life of the unborn. So, um, you know, I, I think this group has, has lost. I'm, I'm, I'm okay in, in America with, with groups. Again, the idea, I'm a big, strong proponent. Of, I'm a constitutionalist who certainly supports the First Amendment right and, and that right of people to, to assembly peacefully. Um, but when you start rioting and you start tearing up people's property and you start harassing Americans and, and if you start using terror to accomplish your agenda, that makes you move from a political organization into a terrorist organization. And any, any group that uses terror to, to accomplish its goal, I think, is an enemy of the people of the United States. So that's my thought. Well, and technically, when you're using things like terror, uh, whenever you're threatening people with Molotov cocktails and saying, oh, but if you elect Joe Biden, this will all go away. Uh, that's just it brings very disingenuous. But um, I'm not familiar. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Matt Chandler. He's uh, the the head pastor of the Village Church down in Dallas. But he said something here a few years ago that I want to get your thoughts on. He basically was talking about uh, hiring for church plants. And he said if a, you know, a headhunter brings him a white guy that's in eight out of 10 and a black guy that's seven out of 10, he said, I'm going to hire the black guy every time. And he was talking, you know, of all the things that he does, he, he does kind of have more of a Marxist view on racism, but he's been called out by, you know, giants like John MacArthur and Vody Bauckham as, uh, you know, basically taking part in tokenism. And so from your perspective, from what you see, because you're, you're obviously a very adept guy at kind of reading the tea leaves, do you fear that all the social unrest we're feeling and seeing right now in the country, that it will lead to more tokenism? Let me say this. I'm a big opponent of tokenism. It's one of the reasons when I was in the State House of Representatives, I led the effort in Oklahoma to abolish affirmative action um, in the areas of hiring, um, and, and college admission. And I felt strongly about it because as a, as a father of two minority children, uh, my, my daughter's 15 and my son is 11, and, um, uh, and they're both African-American and Chickasaw, uh, so they're from two minority groups. And then my daughter, of course, is, 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 is from another minority group. It was, it was important to me that they didn't grow up with a stigma that they needed a lower standard in order to compete. Uh, my kids are blessed, like I was. They have two uh, parents who are completely dedicated to their well-being. Um, I had that, and I had, like I mentioned before, I had a terrific church family. I mean, I had a village that saw to my well-being, and my kids have a wonderful village. So they can compete on any standard that you give them. Doesn't mean they're going to always win. Um, it doesn't guarantee an, out guarantee an outcome, but I can tell you, they can compete on any standard you give them uh, because they've been blessed with those resources. And I didn't want anybody to to look at them and I didn't want them to achieve in life only to look back and think that they were able to do it because they had a lesser standard because they, they don't have to do that. And so I'm a big opponent of this idea of, of, of tokenism. Um, and, and, and again, you know, I, I and I don't want to I don't want to. I don't want to skim over what I think the initial protest started out about. I mean, I think when people look on television and they see an atrocity, they see someone being killed, they see an unarmed person, whether that be a black person, white person, female, male or female. But when we see someone unarmed lose their life, we should be moved with compassion. We, we, we should, because I, I think that's that, that, that's part of our uh, Christian um, psyche. I think it's in our Christian DNA as a country, but but certainly on a human level, we should be moved by that. And 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 that I think is what stirred a lot of Americans. However, in that same vein, um, we, we we cannot begin to to lose who we are as Americans, and 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 it is still not a justification. For, for rioting and violence uh, in the streets. And, and that, that, I think, goes to 
the heart of where the, the country is right now and where people are struggling. I, I think it's OK to to grieve with with, with innocent blood, sh- with innocent lives that have been lost and blood that has been shed and also want to support law enforcement and the institutions that have helped to make this country great. I don't think they're the antithesis of each other. Um, and I don't think we should be made to feel like they are. I certainly appreciate that perspective. And there's been one through point, and, and we'll get your, your brief thoughts on this before we move to the last segment of the show here. You've talked a lot in this episode about you know communism, socialism, Marxism. There's been a lot of through points and center points to a lot of the things that you've been saying. Why do you think that those ideas, communism, socialism, Marxism, all the things attached to that postmodernism are so appealing to young people in America today? Um, you know, I, I, I alluded to it a little earlier, Kyle. I, I think our enemy is is not flesh and blood. I, th- I think it's I think we're in a spiritual battle. And I, I think that's what um, now the media can't report on that because the media can't see and understand spiritual things. But those of us who are believers that have been born again and, and are infused with God's Holy Spirit, we, we have spiritualized and we can see what's happening and this whole idea a socialism, I think part of the appeal for socialism is that 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 sin nature in us that is very akin to covetedness. You know, scripture is very clear about coveting the property, the belongings, the gifts, the talents of your neighbor. And I think that's what socialism is all about. It, it is the idea that I'm poor because that person is rich. That's a that's a core Marxist idea. And this idea that I need the government to come in and to create, quote, equity by taking from my brother so that I can have. That is fundamentally against the Christian faith. And so I think that the reason it's so appealing is no, co- the reason socialism is so appealing, it's not a coincidence that we've had a decline in, in church um, church attendance over the years. Um, this generation for younger people um, have a less serious relationship with Christ than we have culturally, historically. And so I think that's where a lot of the appeal is coming from, uh, frankly. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a misunderstanding of, of, of our Judeo-Christian heritage, but it's also a lot of young people haven't been taught in, in civics and government, because a lot of people who I've talked to, and I spent a lot of time speak, speaking to young people, a lot of them see it as the compassionate route. They don't fully understand, you know, capitalism. A lot of young people, and I and I and I like to use this um, this this a lot. I used to, I like to refer uh, to this set of facts a lot. If you really care about the poor. If you truly have a heart, and we should, I think as Christians, we should have a heart for the poor, first of all, then if that's really your heart, then you should really be a capitalist because capitalism is the only form of government that has ever moved some a person out of generational poverty into a middle class. There's not an example of that working on a small level or on a large level in any socialist regime. In fact, Every socialist regime that has ever existed has failed over time. And so if, if you're a true proponent of wanting to to help your brother who's in need, which is what I hear, frankly, a lot of young people saying and a lot of what they think is appealing about socialism. When I explain to them how capitalism is the only way to do that, it's amazing how that light goes off. And so I, I think there's still a way to harness that. We just have to do a better job of telling the story of, of why capitalism works, uh, why it why it helps to promote um, a civil society, and also speaking about how unjust um, how unjust the the idea of socialism is. Well, hey TW, before we let you go, we do one more segment of the show, and that is called "What Would You Say to Someone That Said." And then basically I fill in the blank. And here's the thing is these are 30 seconds or less. That's all you get. So you can't go on and on about these topics, even though they are big topics. You just have to give us the meat and potatoes answers. So you up for it? Yeah, yeah, I am. All right, let's do it. All right, first one here. What would you say to someone that said good people should go into business, not politics? 
I would say good people should go into both. Um, there, you know, politics, I believe, is a is a calling like any other thing. I, I felt called to be there. The 13th chapter of Romans tells us that people who serve in government are ministers. Uh, and I also believe that your business can be your ministry, too. We need we need Christians everywhere. Um, we don't need p- Christians just in one sector, and we certainly don't just need them in the church house. We need them at every table. All right, next rapid fire question here. What would you say to someone that said there's a massive difference between liberals and leftists? I, I would say that used to be the case, but liberals have, with their cancel culture, they've made it intolerable for anybody who doesn't absolutely prescribe to the far left Marxist view. And as a result, there's not a lot of room on the other side for the freeness of thought. You know, the, the good news about being a conservative is we, 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 have, a, we have a very big tent. Um, and, and, and I think that parallels, I'm sorry, I think that is in the antithesis to uh, the modern day kind of liberalism because they're just pretty intolerant of anybody who thinks differently than them. All right. Next one here. What would you say to someone that said the United States is a racist country? If someone said that United States is a racist country, I would tell them they're absolutely wrong. Uh, My life is a great example of how this country is still the best country in the world and it still offers opportunities that no one would ever uh, that no one, that no other country has ever been able to compare to. And it's the reason we have the largest immigration issue than any other nation, because so many people want to be here. And, and it's not just people of the Anglo heritage. It's people from all over the world who want to be here because there's real opportunity. Racism has been a part of our past. There are still racist people in our country. Uh, but when you think about what this country has to offer, that does not at all tell the story. This is still a country about freedom and about opportunity, and that's for everyone. All right, next one here. What would you say to someone that said Donald Trump is a racist? I would say Donald Trump has done more for the African-American community than any president in history um, since Abraham Lincoln. Since Abraham Lincoln. Whether we're talking about the lowest unemployment rate before COVID, whether we're talking about historic funding for historically black colleges and universities, or we're talking about, you know, empowerment zones that have, you know, flooded private sector capital north of $10 billion into underserved communities that are primary that primarily serve African Americans. This president has a real heart uh, for the African American community. And it also has been demonstrated in his criminal justice reform, where he's cleaning up the policies that have devastated black families that have been proposed by the Democrat Party. So Donald Trump absolutely is not a racist and and he has a record to prove it. Next one here. What would you say to someone that said, I want to be a friend of Jesus, not a disciple? I don't know that Jesus is short on friends. Um, I don't know that he's looking. I don't know that he's looking for friends. Um, you know what? What he said was was take up your cross and follow me. And 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 as a disciple of Christ myself, I will tell you that 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 the benefits uh, far outweigh far outweigh the trials. Um, you know the the Lord saved me at a young age, Kyle, and and, and he and he directed my life on a path that I would have never imagined. Um, and, it, and it saved me from a lot of heart, heartache, a lot of hardships. I have a lot of friends, a lot of family that ha- chose a different path. And I am so blessed to be um, um, in, in communion with Christ. And I, I certainly don't always live up to my end of the deal, but, but my end of the deal was so easy. All I had to do was accept his love and his grace and his forgiveness and, 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 and try to trust and try to obey him. And, um, um, he being a disciple of his um, is is a is it, it, filled with benefits and and I would encourage anybody to do it. What would you say to someone that said affirmative action is a wonderful necessary program? I, 
I would say affirmative action has done more to to create a a stigma against African Americans than maybe any other policy in the United States. And 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 every every African American that has attained a level of success or greatness, I don't believe it's because of affirmative action. I think it was in spite of affirmative action. Um, African Americans are capable are as capable as any other race of people. And we do not need a, a second class standard in order to compete. We can compete with the same standard that anyone else has. So um, anybody who believes that I think is, is, is short on, on history in short on who African-American people and other minorities really are. All right. What would you say to someone that said, if Jesus were alive today, he'd be a socialist. I, I would say that's fundamentally flawed and it's a fundamental, fundamentally um, skewed view of who Christ is. Um, the Christ that I know um, is the creator of heaven and earth and he doesn't need to subscribe to any man-made political ideology. I mean, he, he, is, a, he is a theocrat if anything, when, when he comes back, he, he he's going to the, the government is going to be it is upon his shoulders and uh, he will rule and set up his own kingdom. And so if if you live right and if you give your life to him, you'll get to experience the type of government he's going to institute himself. Love that. All right. Just a few more here and then we'll be done for the day. What would you and say? It won't be social, and it won't be socialism. I guarantee that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet I bet you're right. We don't know for sure, but we got a pretty good guess it won't be. Yeah. All right, just a few left. What would you say to someone that said, Donald Trump has my vote in November? Vote early and, and do it in person. All right, next one. It's like it, just different. What would you say to someone that said, Joe Biden has my vote in November? I don't I don't second guess people um, for for supporting who they think is right. I, I think it's the most fundamental part of being American. I, I would say to that person, though, um, think about where we are on the world stage right now and think about what has helped to make this country great and who has a platform and a policy um, record and a policy um, uh, plan. To, to continue and grow that and and I and I think the I think the the choice is pretty evident and it's President Donald Trump in my opinion last question of the day what would you say to someone that said black people just can't get ahead in the United States I think that's a joke the idea that black people can't get ahead in the United States is just absolutely not true um, African Americans if, if you look at it, if you if you want a great example of that you can look at shortly after the Civil War, during Reconstruction in places like Tulsa, America, where in the Greenwood District, where you had a thriving upper middle class of African-Americans who were just recently out of slavery. Um, they African-Americans were doing well. They had an amazing workforce, a skill set uh, that many in the country didn't have because of slavery. And they were able to leverage that in this country and become amazing entrepreneurs. It wasn't until the 1950s and, and, some, and, and, and several programs after that and before that even, where you started this idea of, of a war on poverty that you fundamentally helped to destroy black families. And that's what's created the turmoil. And, and there were other policies as well, uh, many of them advocated by Democrats, I would add, that, that further went to destroy the community and the families. Uh, but African-Americans have thrived in the United States at different times. And this country still creates an amazing opportunity for anybody who has a great work ethic, who's willing to work hard. Um, there's still great opportunity in this country. Well, TW, I've appreciated your perspective on a lot of different issues. We've talked about a lot of things today, but that is all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? Um, I don't think so, Kyle. I really appreciate you asking me on. It's a privilege to get to do it. Um, I'm a big fan of yours, always have been. And um, this is an amazing opportunity 
for this country, this next election, I think is critically important. And I hope everybody goes out and votes. And if you're unsure who to vote for, vote vote red. <laughs> All right, T.W. Shannon, thanks for coming on Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Thank you, Kyle. There you go, guys. That wraps up another interview with another great guest. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. As you know by now, we are a men's ministry and our mission is cultivating manly resilience. Specifically, we do that by providing content like this podcast that helps you forge spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. So for today, I've got some links for you. I've got an interview that T.W. Shannon did on C-SPAN not that long ago, so I got a link to that here. Then there's a YouTube video called Black Voices for Trump, Real Talk with Katrina Pearson, T.W. Shannon, and Paris Denard. Then I got another one that's a little video that was done by the Chickasaw Nation here in the state of Oklahoma. It's called T.W. Shannon on Faith and Family. And the last one is just a link to T.W. Shannon's Twitter page so you can find him there. Thank you guys for listening to the podcast. I really do appreciate it. If you would, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher and refer your friends to listen and share this on social media. Guys, if we deserve a five-star review, please leave us five stars in a few sentences letting us know why you like the content. I'm currently booking speaking engagements for the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. So if you want me to come speak at your company, at your men's event, at your church, just hit me up, info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Our website is www.undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at undauntedlife or facebook.com backslash undauntedlife. Check out our free devotionals on the Version Bible app. Just search Undaunted Life under plans. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their entire music library for our content. The intro outro track on this podcast is our song Defender, which is off their latest record entitled Guardians. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep cultivating manly resilience, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical toughness, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. Run!